Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. Join us each day for the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Well, we've been talking about today's uh, PCE inflation data right on target with estimates. And man, were markets relieved since the recent readings on both consumer and producer prices were above forecast. I think we can agree that the cooling of inflation is a little slower now. Growth, though, is holding up. So the question, how is the White House viewing today's news? Earlier, I spoke with Gene Sperling, senior advisor to President Biden. I began by asking for his takeaway on the data. I think what we're seeing is uh, a recovery that has shown significant resilience. Uh, obviously, as we all know, it was only a year ago where people were predicting, you know, with tremendous uncertainty that the only way inflation was going to come down was by crushing demand, risking a potential uh, uh, recession. And, but I think what we've seen is more and more evidence that the global inflation we saw was primarily driven by things related to the global economy being shut down, starting back up, the supply chain snarls, the supply shortages, and that actually we're seeing uh, you know, something even better than a soft landing because we've been able to see growth stay fairly strong. Uh, unemployment stay under 4%. That's much better than the kind of just soft landing that just misses a a recession. This is solid. Uh, So, you know, for us, I think that uh, this just confirmed what we think is an overall, you know, very positive trend to uh, whether you want to call it a soft landing or no landing. I guess I would say a resilient recovery where the fact that people have spending power with such a large percentage of people are working, where you actually have prime age labor participation actually stronger than pre-pandemic looks positive. The fact that, you know, incomes are up, spending's down a little in a month in January, you know, I, I think we'll all kind of wait to see, you know, what the next couple of months are and 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 look over look at what the trend is you know again consumer confidence had looked strong you had one month where you know it didn't improve but you still have the michigan consumer confidence 25 percent stronger than october so i think what i think what people were probably feeling positive about today was the sense that the the trend is still overall your friend But we are in an election year. And one of the things that I think we can agree on, yes, the data have been positive, whether you're looking at overall economic growth, the strength of the labor market or inflation. But the president doesn't seem to be getting any credit for it. Today, Bloomberg News and Morning Consult released a poll conducted in February. And I'm going to highlight one swing state, Pennsylvania. Only 43 percent of voters believe the economy is headed in the right direction. So I'm trying to understand why the messaging on success has not penetrated and and what needs to change? Well, look, uh, um, you know, I always say that every family is the world's greatest expert on how they're doing. On the other hand, what people are hearing, uh, how what they see the direction at, that can be something that is affected by what people are hearing and also what they've experienced. So I'm such an old man that I started in the White House uh, in 1993 with President Clinton. And I think that we found in 94 and 1995 that even though the deficit was down, even though unemployment was down, you weren't seeing the pickup in consumer confidence. There can be a lag, particularly if people have been worried for a while. And it's been a pretty tough few years for people going through the pandemic, two variants, 2022, where we saw global prices go high. We saw a war in Ukraine, you know, royal energy and and food markets. Uh, So people don't always react on a dime with the, you know, with the news. They can want greater reassurance. It can take a while to change 
you know, people's uh, attitudes. Gene, before I let you go, I want to talk about trade relations, particularly U.S.-China, certainly to become a hot topic as we move closer to the election. How should we be thinking about the way in which the administration wants to deal with China, whether it's export controls or what we learned today, where the president is taking steps to block Internet connected Chinese cars and trucks from entering the American market? Look, overall, putting China to the side, this is a president who has done so much with the CHIPS Act with the infrastructure bill, with the Inflation Reduction Act to attract hundreds of billions of dollars of investment here. We want people to move factories here. We want them to create jobs here. We want American companies and American jobs to do well. And we want people to uh, uh, who might be in another country to decide to build their future here. Um, but the president's very clear. Uh, When it comes to both security and economic fairness, uh, he's going to insist on both from China. And, you know, to the degree that there is uh, government led overcapacity that that uh, uh, put our workers at a disadvantage in, you know, important manufacturing areas or, as you've seen, uh, uh, things that we do not have the confidence in that would not be a threat to not just national security, but but the data and privacy of Americans. Uh, as you saw today, uh, we're we're going to be clear, uh, clear as a bell, and we're going to be, you know, tough uh, when necessary. Gene Sperling, senior advisor to President Biden. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. The U.S. is not yet calling for a ban on Chinese EVs, but could impose some limitations on imports of the vehicles or parts. Joining us now for some discussion of this is Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg Technology show host. So, Ed, we we understand that there are some risks here, uh, data and cybersecurity risks. Uh, I, I want to say this in a flippant way to get people's sure. attention, uh, but there's a there's a serious question embedded. Is is Gina Raimondo seeing a Chinese ghost around every corner? Yeah, there's a close look at it. I mean, you have to remember that the barrier to entry for Chinese cars in America is literally high because of the Trump era tariffs, right? There's a 27.5% tariff on any Chinese built EV that that wants to be sold here. So they've not become pervasive. Um, But this is really interesting. You have to compare what the US is doing versus Europe because the US is saying we're looking at this through the lens of national security, not economics. Whereas if you look at Europe, they're saying we're going to take a real look at Chinese EVs because we're super worried economically that they'll outcompete our industry. Exactly. Why not call a spade a spade? That's the thrust of the question. So I, I think, you know, we've actually seen this as a kind of tit for tat. There was a very similar story with Tesla last year and the year before, where the Chinese government looked at Teslas that were owned by Chinese government employees and officials as a security concern because of the data that that runs through the car, right? Think about the just the, the miles of telematics and, and personal or consumer data that, that a modern day vehicle has. The U.S. is doing something similar, you know, like each computer is based, each computer, each car is basically a computer on wheels these days. And so what the U.S. is doing, according to the official that Bloomberg spoke to, is looking at those vulnerabilities as a precursor to making a firm policy decision on Chinese made EVs in this country. So Brian and I were talking earlier, Ed, about uh, the change that may occur when Chinese manufacturers begin setting up production facilities in Mexico with the idea of moving those vehicles into the American market. Does any of this uh, kind of run up against a a massive change as a result of um, what the administration is trying to achieve? I think that's a really smart question. And you have to go back to the stipulations of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, 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 the Treasury and, and IRS guidelines, which is it's not just where the vehicle is made, but it is 
every single component where the component is made, but also the ownership of the company that made that component. So let's just take like, I don't know, let me think of something equally as flippant. Let's take a, a, a nut and bolt, you know, on the on the on the axle of the car. Um, if if that nut or bolt comes from a supplier that is owned by 25 uh, percent Chinese ownership or higher, it's not eligible for the, the 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 federal tax credit or any other access to public funds. So there's a disincentive there. But again, go back to the Bloomberg reporting. Right now, this is not about economics. It's about national security. And so the supply chain issue at this time is not what's un- under the under the microscope. Is it possible that the European Union, uh, even though you mentioned it's a different approach, they're challenging on economic rather than national security concerns, but is it possible that they too have these concerns about uh, security risks? Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, we we look at uh, the European Union as not just uh, a governmental body, but a regulator, right? And certainly in my coverage of broadly of the technology sector, the European Commission, you know, if you think as a parallel example, social media and TikTok, they have the same debates in that jurisdiction as we have here with the safety of TikTok and and whether it provides a vulnerability to their citizens because down chain, the, the Chinese government may or may not have access to data. And so there's some evidence that the European Union looks at Chinese vehicles in the same lens. But I would underscore that Europe came out early and said, look, this is just an issue of competition. We don't want to get outdone or undercut by the Chinese suppliers. In, in the bigger picture, though, I'm trying to understand the supply demand imbalance. I'm looking at your story now on Fisker, the company wow, yeah. raising substantial doubt about its ability to be basically an ongoing operation. 15% of the workforce gets cut. Right. Are, are we living in an era where there's simply too much capacity? Uh, Fisker is a wild story that has its own unique problems. But what the CEO told me in an interview earlier is that there is a demand problem. You know, Fisker has a unique business model where it has a contract manufacturer, Magna International, and they build Fisker's EVs on their behalf at a plant in Austria. And they can build as many or as few as they want. So what Fisker said is we're going to make 20 to 22,000 in 2024. But if demand improves, we can just dial up because of our unique business model. This is a company that's seriously and financially shaky, right? Seriously in trouble. And what they've told investors this evening is there is one unnamed automaker waiting in the wings who has agreed to partner with Fisker and give them a cash injection. The deal's not done yet. Um, and... Uh, it will happen soon, is what the CEO told me. But here go, goes back to the root of your question. EV demand is down right now. Everyone is pulling back. So why would an automaker make an investment in another EV name like Fisker in that environment? And you guys probably see the stock down 37% in after hours. If if prices continue to get cut, because even BYD has struggled, uh, yes. even though it has it's outselling uh, Tesla, but it has struggled because having to lower prices and the margins are really cut. Uh, it, it starts to become. I mean, does that bring the other automakers, more automakers, into the picture, or does it just mean that um, it's going to, you know, it's going to undercut um, the the overall thrust of the industry yes. you know, over the next couple of years? I, I mean, what's unique about China's EV market is there are many more individual players, right? The consumer has more choice. But we've learned pretty quickly that the Chinese economy is not immune to what's happening around the world. So there's there's some pressure there. You know, the, the, the overall picture is we, we live in a really high interest rate environment around the world. The financing of your car is probably your second biggest expense after your mortgage or your rent. And the, the first, the so-called first adopters have been and gone in North America and Europe. So what's left is a, is a price conscious consumer and the EV price premium is still so great even after price cuts that they're still going for cheaper combustion engine models. In China, that, that, that's less so the case. But because there are so many players, you've got to cut prices to be competitive. Yeah, but we also have the issue of tax cuts to consider, right? And yeah. then there's the charging infrastructure story and whether or not that's not only reliable, widespread enough so that consumers feel comfortable in, in making the investment. 
Yeah, and today is a big milestone in North America on that front, right? Because Tesla has opened up its charging network to other companies. So today, Ford customers could start charging their Ford EVs using a Tesla charger with an adapter. But that answers your question, right? That Ford had to make the painful reputational decision to, to ask Tesla for help because the infrastructure broadly wasn't there beyond what Tesla offers. Um, and, and that is true of many jurisdictions around the world. So back to the original investigation that uh, sure. we talked about with Gina Raimondo and, and Joe Biden. Uh, does that overlap with one uh, that we saw yesterday, an executive order that was also about data security? Yeah. I mean, what I'm learning, and, and actually I'm learning this in the context of AI companies as well, guys, is that you know the Commerce Department and, and other government agencies are very closely aligned on the topic. You know, again, I just repeat that this is a cybersecurity and uh, data security issue for the time being in the in the car context or EV context, and it's not billed as a competition or economic problem. But but this administration is increasingly thinking about this, and we're in an election cycle where you know look at Bloomberg's reporting out of Washington D.C. and the relationship with China for both sides of the aisle and both eventual candidates is going to be front and center in this election. So uh, the, what's analogous is, yes, it's cybersecurity. But in this case, remember that the, the car is a computer on wheels. That's what I'd ask your audience to take away. Yeah. And what we're hearing from officials is that's the concern. So a Chinese price war, although I note that Li Auto has surged something like 67% in the last month uh, with some uh, new designs and such. Uh, Ed, thanks very much for joining us out of time now. Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg Technology show host with us live here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Manufacturing activity in Asia slumped in February. Factories wrestling with weak demand in China and supply chain disruptions in major shipping routes. Factories across North Asia cutting output and new orders last month. Joining us now is David Chu, Bloomberg China economist, to take a look at how China may be at the heart of this. How much is China, in a sense, David, spreading out uh, some of its weakness to other countries? Well, um, actually, I think uh, if you look at the, the PMI itself, uh, uh, you got a very weak reading uh, because of the uh, the drop in the in the uh, manufacturing PMI uh, this month. But actually, I want to say that it's not only this month because China's slowing slowdown has started uh, several uh, months ago, and uh, you, we all know that um, China is the buyer of of materials uh, from Southeast Asia. So that uh, the slowdown of China definitely will uh, well not will it's influencing the uh, Southeast Asia uh, economies. And uh, previously, um, China's slowdown also influenced the South Korea as well. But this time, we think uh, we see that the South Korea export uh, outperforms. Uh, we think that this was uh, because of the export of uh, tri chips, so that um, uh, we can see that the electronic and the AI um, contribute some uh, uh, strength to to uh, South Korea. So that. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the Southeast Asia, uh, the exporters of uh, industrial materials, uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, f suffering somehow from China's slowdown. Yeah, I think it's important to remember. I, sometimes I forget that PMI data is kind of soft data. It's a sentiment indicator. And when you think of sentiment, particularly given the challenges confronting China right now, it's all about sentiment, or a lot of it seems to be the lack of it, a positive sentiment and the lack of confidence. Next week, we've got the NPC meeting. What do you think the government can do to begin to begin? I know steps have already been taken, but what let me say it another way. What more can be done to kind of tackle this issue of just weak sentiment? Uh, well, it, it is two problems, what it should do and what it will do, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let me say what they should do. Uh, in, in our mind, um, 
the better way for the uh, government is to declare their uh, eager for priority uh, for uh, development or for, for growth. So that let the market know that uh, the top leaders are still taking growth as the first priority. And they are willing to do something uh, to help the economy. So uh, that is the concrete information they need to uh, convey to the market. Uh, but on the other hand, what they can do is we think uh, if we look at the, the target, we think that they are going to set the target growth target at 5%, which is actually uh, a strong target for us because although we achieved 5.2% year-on-year GDP growth last year, it was largely because of the low base in the previous year. So that in this year, if they set the 5% as the target, that would be a high bar. Uh, in addition, uh, people will look at the uh, fiscal deficit target. Uh, I think, in my mind, this could be something undershoot market expectation. Uh, we are expecting something like 3.2%, uh, but we think the market is expecting more. The Caixin manufacturing PMI was actually a, a little bit more positive, uh, and it generally tends to be. Uh, but this reading was 50.9, a little up from the 50.8 in January. Uh, and you've seen the bounce in the equity market. We've seen about 10% gains in a couple of weeks for the CSI 300. I know there's been a lot of uh, hands-on measures from authorities uh, on that. But are there some bright spots? Can we, can we think about things getting better here over the next few months? Well, we think it's too early to say so, um, because uh, uh, the, the first uh, two months in China, usually we don't have, we don't have concrete data expected for PMI uh, inflation, uh, because uh, it is the, uh, the, the Lunar New Year holiday distorting the, uh, the whole thing. So that, uh, but we can also look at the high frequency data and uh, also the consumption during the Lunar New Year holiday. And uh, what we got it was that, um, you know, overall on balance, it is still uh, tilted to the, uh, to the negative side. Uh, one of the key reasons is that the, the home sales is still very weak. Um, I read the data last day, uh, couple of days ago that uh, in the first two months, uh, the sales uh, uh, in value was uh, 50% down from last year. So it tells us that the housing sector is still weak because of the weak confidence or sentiment in the household sector. So we're ready to wrap up here. I can give you 30 seconds, David, to tackle the problem with deflation and trying to revitalize consumption. What's the best way for the government to do that? Hand out money? Uh, well, I don't think there is a silver bullet to, so, to solve this def, uh, deflation problem. Well, uh, in the past, based on the past experience, if the PBOC opens the door for easing, it could help. But on the other hand, you know, uh, China is trapped with um, high debtness, so that uh, uh, strong or ag uh, uh, aggressive easing for the PBOC is yep. not so vi visible. Right? Okay. All right, David, thank you. David Chu, Bloomberg China economist. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. 